Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for what you're doing in our midst, God, in the Philippines and here in Kingston. And I just invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and to speak to our hearts and change our lives today. God, we, we want to know you. We don't want to just know about you, God. We want to be intimate with you, God. Lord, we want to uh, be used by you. We want you to take over our lives and do with us whatever is in your heart. So God, I ask for your anointing today as I share this word in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are recording also. Uh, say hi to all our Filipino uh, students. We're going to be uploading and sharing that with them. Uh, online as well as uh, with this message. But I want to talk to you today about, it's called migration restlessness. <laughs> migration restlessness. I, yesterday I, I got this word, I felt like it was from the Lord, and I'm just going to read what I wrote. Birds were made to fly, not to be caged. During 2020, the Lord has called his church to a place of nesting in his presence. The enemy has intimidated the body of Christ that instead of abiding in the nest of God's presence, we have allowed ourselves to become trapped and caged by the enemy. Do not confuse the cage of fear with the nesting of God's presence. In the nest, you can come and go freely. In the nest, you will find protection and warmth and underneath the wings of the Almighty. Soon the Lord will end this season and when he does, make sure you are not caged, but that you are nesting. The season of migration is coming. The harvest is ripe. A cage church cannot reap what God is preparing. Loose yourself from the bindings of the enemy's cages. Rest in the nest of God's presence. He is moving you into this next great harvest. The time is coming for us to migrate from Psalm 91 to Matthew 28. Psalm 91, a lot of us have been quoting that. He who dwells in a secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Well, a lot of people have been quoting that psalm during this whole pandemic. This whole situation, or I should say a lot of it to me, and this is my opinion, political plan, plandemic. <laughs> I didn't mean to say plan, but I did. Um, Matthew 28. What is that? At the end of Matthew 28, it talks about after Jesus rose from the dead, he stood before his disciples, and, and he gave them the great commission. Go ye therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the earth. We've got to understand that the greatest times that the church has grown in history is when there's hardship and persecution. Why? Because people draw near to God. When we don't need God because we could sustain ourselves with our money, our food, our homes, our insurances. And you guys have a lot of insurances here in the States. When we can sustain ourselves with that, essentially it teaches us really not to walk by faith anymore. And not to really abide in the Lord. Now maybe some of you have all those things and you still know how to walk by faith. But this is one of the reasons. Jesus said that we should not love money. He didn't say having money was wrong. He said don't love it because if you love it more than me you separate yourself from me. You cannot love God and love this world. Amen. And I think people are realizing that because when you're in a place of need, we don't come to Jesus to fit him into our lives. We come to Jesus to surrender everything. That, that's, we don't serve a God, we don't serve God on our terms. We serve God because there's no other option. If you try to go through Allah, you're finding the wrong direction. If you try to go through Donald Trump, you're going the wrong direction. But you know the Messiah is not Donald Trump, it's Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords. I'm not against Trump. I pray for him. I pray that God's man will get in this next Oval Office time. <laughs> because look, 
We have our plans. Man makes his plans, but the Lord ordains his steps. And, and, and I know who I'm going to vote for, and I think probably a lot of you are going to vote for the same person. But I know this, is that whoever we're going to vote for, they're not going to save America. Or the nations. Jesus is. Jesus is the one who shed his blood. There's no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. That's, that's period. <laughs> Maybe an exclamation point's better. It, it needs to be clear in our understanding because here, if we think politicians, if we think more money is going to change our lives, then you know what happens when somebody gets cancer and there's not, you know, an antidote for cancer at the moment? People realize that the doctors and the medicine is limited and there's only one option that we know of and that's Jesus Christ, the healer. And, and some of you may be dealing with physical situations that seem impossible. Maybe you're dealing with family situations that seem impossible. Maybe it seems like this whole uh, coronavirus season, this whole thing has, has changed your life dramatically and, and things have happened. Maybe you lost your home. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe, you know, things in the home are very difficult because if, if Jesus is not the center of the home, we don't know how to relate to one another. And I'm not blaming or condemning anybody. I'm simply saying is that in the most desperate time in America's history, Jesus Christ needs to be elevated and exalted. I'm praying for a third great awakening. I was a part of a revival in Pensacola, Florida that lasted for five years. Four million people came through the doors of that church, not because of a great preacher or a nice sanctuary or a choir or anything like that. They came because the Spirit of the Lord was moving in power. I, over 350,000 people gave their lives to Jesus. In the first six months of the revival, 130,000 people got saved. There was no advertisement. There was no social media. It, it was God moving. People were praying. People were desperate. People were thirsty for God. And when we get hungry for God, Jesus says, I'll fill you. I'll come. See, the problem is we, we have full churches but not hungry Christians. And see, when we, when we get out of the mindset of being religious and doing our duty because we think we're doing God a favor, we start recognizing that there's more to this life. That if this whole abundant life thing, which I think has been taken the wrong way, that God wants to give you health and wealth and, you know, have you driving a Mercedes and, you know. Look, I don't care if God blesses you uh, and, 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 and you use that for the kingdom. That's awesome. But if that's what you think abundant life is about, then you need to ask the disciples who all ended up dying, except one, being martyred for Jesus. See, we don't like to talk about martyrdom and stuff because we think, oh, the, you know, the Muslims, they, they do that, and that's crazy. But see, we're not talking about committing suicide. We're, com we're talking about giving our lives because he's worthy. And, and, I'm, and I'm not talking about taking somebody else's life. I'm talking about us laying down our lives so that other people, we do what Jesus did. You know, and, and I, I don't know if you and I will have that opportunity to lay our lives down for the gospel. But what I do know is that Jesus is the only one who could do for me what he's done in my life. And I got to give him everything. Listen to this. I was looking at this website um, the other day about birds. <laughs> I don't really get into birds much. The only bird I get into is chicken. <laughs> but for birds, the urge to move or migrate cannot be contained. The pull is so intense that even a sandpiper's bird's organs or muscles, a trophy reduce to accommodate the demands of migration. This is what happens during the process when they know they're supposed to move on. A, cage, a caged robin will launch itself northward again and again in a cage, hammering against glass walls even if it has no view of the outdoors. There's a scientific term for this. It's called, it's a German word, so if you're German, forgive me right now. It's called Zug Unruh. A German word that means migration 
restlessness. There's no mistaking the signs. Wings fluttering, sleeplessness, disruption of normal activities. We've all experienced this feeling at some point, especially in 2020. Suddenly, the fact of sitting in an office chair or under fluorescent lights in the front of a blue computer screen seems not routine, but intolerable. How many of you just said, I need a vacation? <laughs> right? You know, how many of you, you know, not being able to go out and do certain things and even come together as a church and stuff, you're just like, this is making me crazy. Because we're not designed to do that. And I unfortunately do not agree with the governor of this state, nor other politicians. And if that gets me in trouble, that's fine. I'll win people to Jesus in jail. I make, I, not saying that I want to go there right now, but you know, I appreciate the clapping. But you understand what I'm saying. I have a friend who uh, was in Vietnam. He was a, uh, uh, in a witch doctor. He had tattoos all over his body. And he got radically saved. This is a long time ago. And he got radically saved at a Christian meeting outdoor where Christians were preaching the gospel. A missionary in Vietnam. And he came to the Lord and then he started preaching. But because he was in the northern part of Vietnam where it's not legal to do all those things. He was thrown in jail. So he ended up winning people to the Lord and establishing a cell church in a prison system. That at, this is over 15, 20 years ago I heard this, that had over 40,000 people connected to it. You see, don't allow the enemy to lie to you and say you're in a cage. No, you're in a nest. And if you're in a season where you're feeling something rise up in you and, and saying, I got to do something for the Lord because you've been spending time and you've been nesting in his presence. I'm telling you, you're feeling something that God is stirring and I believe awakening the church in America for something that he wants to do. I believe there's a move of God coming. I believe there's a move of the Holy Spirit of something that we've never seen. The Brownsville Revival, Pensacola Revival we were a part of, it was awesome. And that was a local church. I want to see what God can do in a nation. How many of you know that God did not create us to be caged? He created us to be free. Amen? The great commission calling Jesus gave was not to go and be busy, but to go and be free. To go take the gospel to Local and internationally. The enemy, I believe, has used COVID uh, to cage Christians for being free and sharing our faith. It's time for the church to break out of the cage of fear, shame, and control. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. The only time that we read about Christians being caged is like Paul when he was thrown in prison. You see, when we, Casey and I went to Israel in 2016, end of November, December, we prayed to do that for 20 years. The Lord provided it. It was supernatural. We went there. God totally impacted our lives. And then one year later, I find myself in Italy. And I'm ministering in, in Sicily. And when I was flying from Sicily to go back up to Rome, I actually had one day in Rome to spend a night, and I ended up getting this hotel, which is right next to the Colosseum. And it was phenomenal because I wanted to go to Colosseum because I wanted to go see where Christians were, gave their lives for the gospel. I, 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 I'm great. I want to see the views and all those things, but that's what I wanted to go see because I honor people who lay their life down for the gospel. And uh, my Italian friend told me, hey, when you go up there next to the Colosseum, there's this little, it's, I think it's called Marmitine Prison. There's a, I mean, it's a dungeon. If you've ever seen something in Hollywood, this is what you picture, where it's just big stone rocks enclosed, and it's actually underground. It's where Paul the Apostle was held before he was killed. And he wrote some of the book of Timothy there. 
And so nobody was there. All the tourists were at the other places. I went down in that prison cell and I sat down on the floor. And I just sat, I did a little video and everything. And here I was, you know, one year before I was in Jerusalem and now I'm in Rome. And I'm sitting in there, I see chains on the side. I don't know if they were the original ones, but he was chained. It was cold, it was damp. And here he's, Paul the Apostle is writing to his son Timothy in the faith. And he's, and it's for the greater body of Christ, warning them, fight the good fight of faith. I'm, I'm in chains for this gospel. And, and he looked at it as a trophy. He looked at it as, you know, I am not going to stop preaching the gospel. We know that he was thrown in that prison after he was uh, confined on a ship with, which wrecked in Malta. And, 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 and then he eventually came to, uh, into Sicily and then uh, an area called Syracuse where we get Syracuse. And he comes up Italy and ends up in Rome. And then while he's, after he's in that prison, he, he is taken one day and he's beheaded. And... That's the history, the ending of Paul the Apostle. How many of you are grateful for the life of Paul the Apostle? There's a, amen. There's a recent song, I'd encourage you to download it. It's called Cages by We the Kingdom. And how many of you know that song? I heard that song and I've not stopped listening to this song. We put it loud in the car and we're driving down the throughway. Cages, you know. Listen to some of these words. What if I took a risk? What if I opened my heart and let you see in? What if I took my mask off? And I don't think they were thinking of that when they wrote this, but I like it. Trying to fit in. I don't want to be a mannequin. What if I let my guard down? What if I took a breath? What if I wasn't perfect? What if I was just a mess? What if I bled my soul out, given all I could give. I'm so tired of pretending. I'm coming out of my cages. I'm stepping down from my stages. I'm sick and tired of faking it. What I would have give to be known. What if I got new armor? What if I swung my sword? You know what? What if we start swinging this thing around? I'm sick and tired of faking it. I, I, I don't have time to go through the whole thing. But listen to this. I I was reading this article on why birds migrate, and, and this is what they said. Birds migrate to move from areas of low or decreasing resources to areas of high or increasing resources. The two primary resources being sought are food and nesting locations. Birds that nest in northern hemisphere tend to migrate northward in the spring to take advantage of growing insect populations, budding plants, and abundance of nesting locations. As winter approaches and the availability of insects and other food moves south again, escaping the cold is a motivating factor, but for many species, uh, including hummingbirds, they can withstand freezing temperatures as long as adequate supply of food is available. I, I, I find this really interesting. So here's some of the types of migration. I'm going to give a little application after. The term migration describes periodic, large-scale movements of populations of animals. One way to look at migration is to consider the distances traveled. The northern cardinal is is a resident bird. It does not migrate. They're able to find adequate supplies no matter where they are supposed to be. The northern bobwhite, it goes a short distance and migrates, only moves a short distance as from higher to lower elevations on a mountainside. The blue is a medium distant migrant, covers distances that span one to several states. And the magnolia warbler is a long distant migrant that uh, migrates, typically move from breeding ranges in the United States and Canada to wintering grounds in South and Central America. Despite the arduous journeys involved, long distance migration is featured on some 350 species of North American birds. 
They said the pattern of migration can vary within each at category. But the most, uh, the most amount of birds tend to stay within short or medium distances. I believe the majority of believers around the world are not just going to go long distances. But the majority of us are going to stay kind of close to home. You know, some, you might move a state over or several st states or, uh, you know, but moving to the other side of the world. How many of you have lived in another country? Raise your hand. Okay. Just a handful of people. How many of you have stayed in New York your whole life? Now look around. Raise your hand. The ma majority of us. How many of you came to New York from another place? Awesome. Okay. Well, welcome. <laughs> Probably lived here longer than I have. I was born in Kingston, but, you know, it's been a while. Each of us have a mission field. Everybody in this room has a mission field. Everybody in this room is a missionary. If you're a Christian, you're a missionary. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you follow the Great Commission. And, and that is to go make disciples of all men, right? Making Jesus famous. That's what I like to call it. In fact, we have a t-shirt back there that says that. In Acts 1 verse 8, uh, Jesus told the disciples that you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Say witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Some of you will stay at home. Some of you will go a short distance. Some will go a mid-range distance. And some of you will go to the nations. Do you know what the word witness is translated in the Greek? It's martyrs. But you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And you will be my martyrs in Jerusalem, Judea. Now, I'm not trying to scare you today. If this is your first time in the church, you're thinking, who's this nut job? I'm not the pastor. That's Pastor Frank, so I'll pass those questions on to him. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, American Christianity is being dealt a knockout blow. So that authentic, biblical Christianity can be lifted up. The way that things were, I hope, will never be the same again. There's a new normal, and it's God's normal. It's not according to man. It's not according to religious uh, institutions or leaders. It's all according to the Spirit of Jesus. That's why we worship Him. People ask us, how did you know that you were called to the Philippines? And that's kind of a loaded question. So I'm just going to briefly share something with you that I think will answer that, uh, that happened to me the other day. So my nephew, uh, Devin, who's uh, I think working today, is not able to be here. And all of you know Devin. Devin loves to play basketball. And I play basketball a lot throughout high school. I went to high school in Minnesink Valley. And, you know, we beat Kingston a couple times. Anyway, um, but... Um, <laughs> But Devin likes to play, and I was like, man, I've been wanting to do that with him. So he said, man, there's this place called the East Coast Athletic Club, I guess, in Goshen, Middletown area. And uh, he said, if you can come, I'd love to come. I wanted to bring my son Jonathan. Just wasn't working out time-wise. But we saw that there was a 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. like basketball time. I think, well, that probably won't be too much people. But I didn't realize that the place had been closed and just opened up within the last couple of weeks, I guess. Two to three weeks. So that means there's probably going to be a lot of people there. And there's three basketball courts in there. And I love to play basketball. So I said, I'll go meet you there. We'll hang out. Had this plan. And then I walk inside while I'm waiting for Devin to get off of work. And I said, hey, what do we got to do to play ball? You know, I was thinking we had to pay some. He goes, yeah, it's about $10 to play, but um, we don't have any more room tonight. I said, what do you mean? He says, we have over 60 people here tonight. And he says, none of these guys are going to leave right now. And I can't allow any other people. I'm like, yeah, be kidding me. I drove all the way from Kingston. So... 
I'm sitting in the parking lot, and I'm just, you know, look, when, when you're a missionary, you got to learn to be flexible. <laughs> we, we stay in different people's homes. You know, we travel a lot. Uh, I don't, I can't even tell you how many places we've been since, you know, we've been here in Pensacola. We went through Alabama, North Carolina, Virginia, you know, Pennsylvania. I'm probably missing a state or two. And then after today, we're going to head down and go to New Jersey and Delaware. And then we're going to go to North Carolina. Then we're going to come back up to New Jersey. Then we're going to go to West Virginia. Then we're going to go to Huntsville, Alabama. Then we're going to go back to Pensacola and back down to Tampa and Lakeland. And that'll be about Christmas time. (laughs) And so we don't have any idea when we're going back. So what we're going to do is serve Jesus and, and hopefully just release that spirit of revival wherever we go. Because, and I'm not talking about just meetings. I'm talking about personal revival. Because we can't be in, in, in all the places. I, I don't even believe I'm supposed to be here. <laughs> Let me read what I wrote the other day. I said, you know, if you're around uh, 46 years old or, uh, or so, give or take some years, um, you're probably familiar with Billy Joe, right? So we all know the song, New York State of Mind. And so I was growing up when I wasn't a believer. I listened to a lot of Billy Joel, you know. And, uh, and I was driving on this route to go back from Goshen to Kingston the other night. And as I was driving, I, it reminded me that I used to take this route every weekend when I was a kid. Because my mom and dad were divorced, and my mom married uh, Jim, uh, Charlene Janine's uh, dad, and that's how we became family years ago. And um, my dad would pick us up on Friday because he lived in Kingston, and we'd go to Kingston, and then Sunday night we'd come back and be back in Middletown. So I was thinking about it as I'm driving on the thruway the other night, and that song, New York State of Mind, came on. And I, and I just was like, I hadn't heard that song in a while. And it just reminded me of all these memories of things of being in New York State. Because, you know, we come every two years. You know, sometimes I come back in October every year for the feeding program. But I don't get to spend a lot of time in New York. And the past week or so that we've been here, we've gotten to spend the most time that I've had in Kingston since I was a kid. You know. And while I miss New York... And there's so many memories and places that been to a family that still lives here and all of that. I I recognize something that I really don't belong here anymore. Now I'm from here and I and I love and I'm not trying to limit the Lord. Maybe one day he would bring us back. I have no idea. But I know in my heart that what God has done, he does has not called us to live here. In fact, I I don't have a New York state of mind anymore. What, what I felt like the Lord says is now I've given you a kingdom state of mind. Because I, I don't even feel like I'm supposed to be here in America. And, and while we're here and we know the situation is very unique and different, I have this sense that what Jesus has done in our hearts, this testimony that's always constantly burning. Let me tell you something. During this entire time where everything has changed, at the beginning of it, I said, Lord, I put everything on the altar. Everything that we lived for and done in the Philippines the last 17 years that we lived there. I put it on the altar for you. Whatever you want us to do, we're going to follow you. And I don't believe our time in the Philippines is over yet. What I believe is that during this season of having to be flexible and just go with the Spirit of God, it's only drawn me closer to the Lord and made my prayer life more intimate. I have a sense of burning passion for the Lord's presence. I could care less about crowds. I could care less about anything else except that God is glorified because I do what I do not to uh, for myself but to make Jesus famous. That's why we do it. We do my whole family's doing this, not just me. I want to challenge you today to think about even though you live in this world, you're not of this world anymore. Your citizenship is in heaven. 
You've got to know who you are in Christ and put the sin away and then say, God, what have you called me to do? Because any of you that are sitting here and having maybe a bad attitude or, or a hard time listening to me today because you think this guy's a nut job, well, let me just tell you something. When you fall in love with Jesus and you're tired of serving him out of religious duty, but you get to know him and understand that he wants you to be your, his son and daughter, it changes your perception on how God wants to use you in this life. And you have a sense of destiny and purpose. You see, I have a destiny a as you do. And I may have shared this once before and I'm kind of going off my notes a little bit. But I found out once when we went to the Philippines to Okinawa on our way to the States years ago that while I was in Okinawa, I called my dad. And I never met my grandfather because he died when my dad was around 18, I think. And he was in the military. He was in the U.S. Navy. And my dad, while I'm in Okinawa, Japan, and I go there every year, been doing that for years, he said, hey, I called him up. I said, Dad, I'd be looking out for a van for us when we get back. You know, we're going to have to find something as we travel. He says, you're in Okinawa right now. Just came from the Philippines. He said, you know, your grandfather was stationed in the Philippines and Okinawa. I said, wow, that's wild. He said, in fact, your grandfather was serving on a ship called the USS Shaw. It was a destroyer ship. And during World War II, right before, you know, America jumped in because of uh, Pearl Harbor bombing, the day before the bombing took place in December 7, 1941. December 6, 1941, my grandfather was in Hawaii on that ship and he was told to leave to go to mainland U.S. And he ended up leaving on December 6th. The next day, the bombing took place and most of his shipmates were killed. That ship was destroyed. My dad's telling me this as I'm in Okinawa. And I start recognizing some. See, when you spend time with Jesus, when you spend time nesting in his presence, when you become so aware of his nearness that he's not just some religious figure to you, but he is God Almighty and he's your very best friend, you start hearing the voice of God and inclining your ear to pay attention to his direction and, and love for you in your life. You start recognizing the purpose and destiny that God has for you. And what the Lord told me and was making it clear that my grandfather was killed on December 7th, 1941. My dad would not have been born on 1950. And if my dad was not born in 1950, I wouldn't be born in 1973. And I wouldn't be talking to my dad in Okinawa, Japan on the phone. When I got to the States, we went, we flew into Tampa. We went up Pensacola. It's kind of our normal route. We go into the Naval Museum of Pensacola. If you ever go there, it's free. I highly recommend going to see it. It's awesome. So I went in and I said to the, one of the people at the desk, do you have a, uh, a Pearl Harbor section? Because I was really interested in finding out more. And he said, yes, we do. It's over here. And there's these huge planes all over. And, and we go there. And here's this wall about this size. And it says, December 7th, 1941. And there's an iconic picture in the middle of a ship being called the USS Shaw. I stood there. When I talk about destiny, my friend, I'm telling you Jesus changed my life. And I'm never the same. I was born in Kingston, but I don't belong here no more. And I know where I belong. I know what God's called us to do. And I'm not going to allow the enemy to cage me and my family anymore. And, and look, we've been able to freely move around. I don't want to make it sound like we're in, you know, some very difficult country. But do you know that the greatest revival in the world right now is happening in Iran? Iran. Through women. Try and figure that out. Women who are not ashamed, not saying that God can't use wisdom. Women, I'm saying you know how that culture is. You walk behind the man. You are fully covered. 
But God is using these, these wisdom and the most powerful revival in the world is happening in Iran right now. That's why there's so much shaking going on. Oh, Jesus. Listen, no matter where your mission field is, the enemy is trying to stop all missions work right now. That's what he's tried to do this year. You got to think bigger outside of just your life, your school, and your job. You got to think kingdom. You got to say, you got to recognize, this is why when Jesus preached, he said, when you preach, this is what you're going to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is what you and I carry. Jesus just brought it from heaven to earth for us. And he abides in us. And he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you could ask whatever you will and it shall be done unto you. See, I, I don't... Look, I honor leaders. We were talking about, you know, submission to authorities and stuff. Totally. But I like what Peter and John said when they stood before the Sanhedrin. They were told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. You know what they said? Can't do that. While we honor those in leadership, we ought to obey God rather than man. You're saying, are you inciting a revolution? No, Jesus did that 2,000 years ago. And he's the commander in chief. And he desires for a people to stand out that are different. That don't just fit in and go with the flow. You say, well, I don't like that kind of Christianity. Well, I'm sorry to tell you this, but there's no other kind of Christianity. If you try to form another type of Christianity and serve a God that doesn't exist, that's called idolatry. That you're making up a, a God in your mind that doesn't exist. You see, the temperature is heating up. And the lines are being drawn. And it's about time that the church rises up without shame, without fear, without worry and anxiety and stress. Why? Because Jesus commanded us to not live like that. That's why he said, dwell in my nest. Dwell in my presence. Grow up and mature in the Lord. I know people, Filipinos, that have gone out and been martyred for their faith, unashamed of the gospel. I know people, one young man who was a part of our ministry, Fire International, that he went to Yemen with his family. He was just teaching English. He wasn't openly, you know, sharing the gospel and stuff because of a lot of regulations and it's very hard there. But he was building relationships and doing it in that way. But because he was white and from America, Al-Qaeda found out about it. And on his way, driving to work to go teach English to these Muslim students who absolutely adored and loved him, he was shot several times. It was in the news and he was killed many, many years ago. Do you know that all of those Muslim people went to the streets holding up signs with his picture on it saying, we love this man. Do you know why they said that? Because it wasn't somebody who said, hey, just come to my church. You know, hey, just, just go through this class. This was somebody who went to them. This is somebody who said, I'm my life down for you. I'm going to serve you. Now he didn't know he was going to be martyred, but now you know what happened? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Richard Warmbrandt said that. If you don't know anything about him, download the book for free and watch the movie on YouTube for free called Tortured for Christ. There's a price to be paid if we want to see a real move of God in America. If, if, if God is going to change America the way that we've been doing things, he would have done a long time ago. But God doesn't need to change. We do. And we need to get out of the mindset of saying, we got to be, we're caged. I can't do anything. Look, I'm, I'm not telling you to just be rude and, and insensitive and not honor people in authority. You know, but listen, right now, we need people that love Jesus enough and are intimate with him not to come out and tell everybody they're a prophet but do things in secret that honor God. I'm going to end with this. Whew. Skip some things here. Listen, we are called to go. And I know all of us have felt some restlessness, some migration restlessness during this time 
But I believe God is calling us to himself to shake us so that as we draw near to him, closer than what we have ever been through before. I've kept telling our students, because I've been doing videos with them online since we've been in here. I said, look guys, don't go through this entire quarantine lockdown season and wish that you would have been closer to the Lord after. And look, people have failed. People haven't been walking in righteousness. They've been a, a you know, you know what I'm praying for next time with the lockdown? That we lose our internet. You know why? Not because I'm on Facebook. I'm on stuff every day. I'm communicating all the time. I love it. But you know what? Whatever it takes to get us hungry for God and be drawn closer to Him, I don't know. You tell me. Right now, I look at things that are happening, you know, with, with all the racism stuff. And I want to tell, look, our black brothers and sisters, I love you. I love you. In fact, I could prove it to you. Because over 20 years ago, uh, uh, I graduated from high school in 1992. And when I graduated, uh, I went to school with most of my friends were black, Puerto Rican, or whatever else. And I'm half Puerto Rican. I just don't look at it. It didn't come out. <laughs> but we would... <laughs> I don't know what happened. I was in the sun too much or something. But I, I would play basketball all the time and, and never a, a, an ounce of racism in my life, in my heart. I, I've grown up. I love, love those folks. But I, I lost contact with them. In fact, my friend Chris was the best man at my wedding in uh, Delaware where I was youth pastoring. And it was funny because we didn't really have any black folks in our church. And when he came to the church and they saw he was my, black, my best man, they're like, oh, you know. But because Delaware, the area where we are, there's just not a whole lot of people there of color. And I, I was happy to stand with him and, and make it clear that anybody messes with Chris messes with me. And I was a youth pastor, so I was giving them five-fold ministry. <laughs> and so I, I shared that. And, and Chris and I lost contact when we moved to Pensacola. Didn't have numbers. And I'm like, man. So for the last 20 years, I've been looking for Chris. <laughs> I've been asking folks. I had no idea where he was. And I look on social media. He wasn't on social media. And I'm like, man, what happened to this guy? Because we were really close. We were good friends. So... I sent another a message to a common friend we had. And I said, did you ever hear what happened to Chris King? He's like, no, I don't know. I, I don't I have any idea. So it was on his mind. He ended up talking to another guy I'd not seen since high school. And, and he said, you know what happened to Chris King? He goes, yeah, I got his number. He says, hey, Eric Miller needs his number. He's been looking for him. So he called up Chris, gave Chris my number. Chris calls me and says, where you been? <laughs> I've been looking for you for 20 years. I said, you got to be kidding me. And Chris is not a Christian. And I said, Chris, man. I said, when, when can we get together? And he said, look, I'm working in the city. Uh, still live in Middletown. And I'm going to drop my daughter off. And I'm going to drive to Kingston tonight. He drove uh, two nights ago. Drove up here. He said, meet me at Buffalo Wild Wings. We met there. He looked at me and had tears, and he said, man, I love you. I said, man, I miss you. I love you too, bro. And, and you know, when you have friendships it, and you don't get to see each other, it, it means a lot. And, and, man, we just talk, talk. He's married. He's got kids. And talked about his struggles. I talked about my struggles. I said, Chris, look, I wasn't really a Christian before, but there's been a lot of changes. <laughs> I said, uh, I'm a missionary. I live in the Philippines for 17 years. He goes, that makes sense. He said, somebody showed me a picture of you standing next to, look like you were playing basketball with Manny Pacquiao. I said, yeah. I said, well, I met him on several occasions and stuff. And, uh, and he's like, yeah. And I said, yeah. I said, I'm still playing, you know. And uh, man, we talk, talk, talk. I'm hoping to see him today on our way down one last time before we go. But, you know, I, I share that stuff because if, if, if we'll put God first, 
if we'll just continue to seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, you know what he promises? All things are going to be added to you. He says, I want to give you the desires of your heart, but make sure the desires of your heart are in alignment and submitted to the purposes of God in your life. Oh gosh, I got so much more. I need to end. Let me, let me close with this. This is my second closing. Um, again, thank you, Pastor Frank, for always having us. We really love you guys and appreciate the opportunity to share. But listen, until all of us learn to make the Lord our nesting place, we're going to migrate through life without purpose. We were created in his image. If you want to believe you came from a monkey, that's fine. I believe I came from dirt. There's no proof that we came from monkeys or an amoeba or whatever you want to call it. Okay? There's no proof of that. There's no transitional. Show me how much evolution has taken place in a human body in the last 2,000 years. I haven't grown a tail yet. Don't have any spikes on the back. You know, maybe a little hairier than I used to be, but that's kind of gross, you know. I don't think I'm like Frank, though. I... Listen, if you don't have purpose, wandering people always lack purpose. I was a wanderer for years. Again, I'm not saying everybody has to come and move to the Philippines. If you want to, come on. We did. It's possible. I, I don't know what God's called you to do, but if you're wandering through life trying to figure out why you're here, where you came from, why you're here, and where you're going, friend, I want to tell you there's so much more to life. Jesus loves you. God has a plan for your life. You have purpose. You have destiny. You have calling. I shared the gospel with Chris the other night. And he had tears in his eyes. He says, tell me everything. Like, Chris is a big guy. He's like 6'4". Always been big. I always like to go to the park with Chris. Because I wasn't sure if I'd get to play. But when I was with Chris, everybody let Chris play. <laughs> God wants us to be a people of purpose. Jesus saved us and gave, a, gave us a mission. Don't lose your vision and your mission during this season. Don't allow the enemy to cage you. Don't ever stop dreaming. Don't ever stop believing what Jesus can do. I'm absolutely, I'm, I'm studying on, on, on a New York revival in history. The, the Charles Finney, the Second Great Awakening, the First Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards was wanting to go to the church of Jonathan Edwards and what is it? Connecticut maybe um, the other day but we called up and they said where are you coming from I said New York and I didn't, wasn't thinking COVID stuff and I said sorry you can't come <laughs> I'm like devil look never stop nesting in Psalm 91 let's migrate to Matthew 28 whatever God's called you to do keep pursuing it in prayer God's timing is perfect he knows what he's doing He's not intimidated. He's not worried like, oh no, who's going to get elected? He's, the, the God in heaven laughs. You understand? I'm, I'm not saying he's not serious. He is serious. He gave his life for you and me. But he's looking at us going, just trust me. You know? That's the New York, you know, thing right there. He uses his hands all the time. There's a lot of Christians who've been caged for so long that when God takes a cage away, they will not know how to be free. Can we all stand a moment? I'm going to pray. And I want to ask you today, are you caged or are you nesting? Are you free? If you feel like today... You need freedom in Christ, whatever it is. I'm not going to judge, criticize anybody. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you came into this place today and you know about God, but you don't know God. You don't wake up in the morning with Jesus on your lips. You don't go throughout the day with Jesus on your heart. You don't live, breathe, eat, and sleep, and drink Jesus. I'm telling you, the Jesus we know, the Jesus I know, he's so real, nothing else is worth focusing your life on. I focus on my wife and my kids and the ministry and everything that we do because Jesus is first. 
I know my wife loves Jesus more than me. We teach our kids love Jesus more than us. Because that sets everything else in order. Jesus gave us two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then love your neighbor as you love yourself. The reason why we can't love our neighbor nowadays is because we don't love God. If you love God, my friend, you're going to love people who are different than you. I've ministered to people in garbage dumps who smell horrible. I've had moms want to hand me their babies and say, please take my baby. And for whatever reason, we, we didn't. And we come back two, three weeks later and the baby died. That happened three or four times. I mean, I, we've seen so many things. I've been to Nepal, the worst poverty I've ever seen. I've been to Japan, I've been to Italy, I've been to the Netherlands. And, and, and you see in the Netherlands, it's predominantly an atheist country now. And that's where John Calvin was. The Reformed Church. Reformed churches are everywhere around here. The Dutch Reformed Church. And now it's dead. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for revival, God. I pray for revival in Kingston, God. Lord, we're not supposed to be here, but the fact that we're here today, I want to stand in the gap as an intercessor and pray, Lord, send your spirit now more powerfully for Jesus Christ's sake. Lord, we pray that prayer that Evan Roberts used to pray in a Welsh revival. Send your spirit now more powerfully for Jesus Christ's sake. Lord, I don't pray for revival. Just, Lord, so that church buildings would be filled, but that hearts would be filled. And that by hearts being filled and people being unashamed of the gospel, that you would not only fill the churches, but fill the streets, God, with people that are calling out to the Lord God Almighty. Change Kingston. Change all these uh, Duchess, Ulster, Orange, all these places. Move uh, in this place. God, we pray for a third great awakening. Lord, you said when you're coming back, you're coming back for a bride that's made herself ready. You're not coming back for a weak and anemic church, God. You're coming back for a beautiful bride. A bride, God, that has prepared in the nesting, in the secret place of the Most High, and has been unashamed of saying, I'm waiting for my bridegroom to come. Lord, in Jesus' name, do something that only you could do here. Lord, use Crossroads Church, God. I bless Pastor Frank and his family, this worship team, the leaders in this church. I know everybody's making difficult decisions, and this is a hard season. But yet, God, I pray that they would come out on top as one of those places that you would use in this city, in this community, to spearhead a move of God. Listen, today, if you need forgiveness, if there's anything between you and the Lord, any type of sin... Anything that's separating you from God. All I want you to do is just lift up your hands right now as a sign of surrender to the Lord and say, I need forgiveness. That's good. Anybody, I'm, if you feel clean and good with God, praise God. No need to do that. But if there's anything separating you from God, and Lord, I pray, God, that chains would be broken right now in Jesus name as they surrender God as you see the desire of their heart to walk in freedom to walk in love God I pray and release destiny over every person in this room I release a fresh spirit of prayer in this house God I ask Holy Spirit that you would rise up with power and authority that we would seek first the kingdom of God Lord that we would obey 2nd Chronicles seven fourteen. And would be those people that you would call out, uh, that you have called out in your name, Lord God. If my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Come from heaven and heal their land. Father, do that in this place, God. Lord, we lift up clean hands and a pure heart because the blood of Jesus is enough. Lord, we repent and we ask for forgiveness. We ask that you would restore us individually as marriages, as families, and strengthen our homes, strengthen our nesting, God. Lord, so that we would pursue you with all the purpose, plans, and destiny that you have for our lives. We give 
the name of Jesus, high honor. You are worthy, Lord, to receive all honor and glory and power and praise. We bless you. Come on, just lift his name up in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, God. We love you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. You're worthy, God. You're worthy, God. There's no other name. Hallelujah, hallelujah.